In this video, I'm going to go through the interface of Home Assistant and integrate some basic things. Make sure you stick around. If you like what you see, hit that subscribe button below and keep an eye out for more videos. Hi, I'm Will from Will Surridge Tech, and today we're going to be having a look at the interface of Home Assistant, looking at where you can find things, and of course getting some smart devices integrated. If you haven't already, check out the first video in this series, where I'll go through the download and installation process of Home Assistant. So let's get going. So, picking up from where we left off last time, we want to get some devices integrated. If we head to the configuration and integration section, we can see that some devices may have already appeared. Don't worry if your devices haven't appeared, because we can integrate them manually later, but these ones have automatically appeared for me. For the ones that do automatically appear, it's super simple. You just press configure, your device should pop up, and then you just need to assign it to an area or room, or even not assign it to an area or room. Once that's done, we click finish, and that's it integrated. If your device doesn't pop up automatically, don't worry, because we can add it manually. If you click on the little plus in the bottom right corner, and then you can just search for the integration you're looking for. You click on it, and then you go through the same configuration process. Sometimes you might need to give it a bit of information, like an IP address or an access code, and then you click finish, and it should pop up. Again, don't worry if your integration isn't listed on this add integration section, because you may have to integrate it in another way. If you go to the Home Assistant website and click on the integrations and search for your integration, you may see that you have to add some lines to the configuration file to actually get it integrated. This is fine, if we do that, then we just need to restart Home Assistant and your device should pop up. There is also another way to integrate devices and that's using the Home Assistant Community Store. I'll come on to that in another video, but basically it's for community members to create it, custom inter integrations rather than the official Home Assistant ones. So there are plenty of devices that aren't officially supported by Home Assistant, but you can still integrate them using the Home Assistant Community Store. So now we've got some devices, let's have a look around Home Assistant. So if we click on Overview, that brings up our main Lovelace UI dashboard. That's a lot of words there. It's not always called Lovelace UI, it's not always called a dashboard, it's not always called a UI, it's not always called Lovelace, but those sort of things point you to this. This is basically your interface for controlling your devices. You can create multiple dashboards, and in each dashboard you can have multiple tabs, and in each tab you can have multiple just layouts, or you can set your own layout. So there are so many ways that you can view your devices and interact with them inside Home Assistant. The possibilities are endless, and I've done a couple of videos on a couple of options of Lovelace layouts you can create, but there are hundreds of possibilities out there, some considerably easier to do than others. But this is where you'll control your devices. In the sidebar, we also have a few other things. Now, as you add some more integrations or some more add-ons, then you'll find that this sidebar becomes quite clogged, uh, but for now we don't have much on it. First up, we have the media browser. In here, you can browse any local media that you have on your Home Assistant device. This could be music, or it could be things like camera snapshots, or camera video recordings, or photos, or anything really. And you can use this to play that media on some supported devices. For example, your TV or your speakers. Next up, we have the history. History is basically a history of all the entities that you have in Home Assistant, a history of their state. You also have a logbook, which is a log of every time that state has changed. And lastly, we have the map. In this map, you can see different zones that you might have set up, or you'll be able to see any device trackers that you have integrated into Home Assistant. In the developer tools, we have lots of useful, well, tools. First of all, we have the states. This is a list of all of your entities and the states that they are currently in and any attributes that they have. For example, a light might be on, but it also might have an attribute which is its color or its brightness. You can use all these attributes 
inside your automations to affect them or to trigger things or you might want to trigger the attribute in the automation. So it's very useful to see which attributes are associated with which entities. That moves on to the services tab. In here you can call a service and that service might be to turn a light on or turn a light off and you can also add data in there which will change the attributes. So turn it on to a certain color or a certain brightness for example. When you type in your service then below will pop a list of the attributes that you can add to make the or to change the effect of the service. So the light has the color, the brightness, the color temperature, all that kind of thing. Next up we have templates. Templating is a very powerful tool to, which you can use to change data from one thing into another thing. You're kind of manipulating that data or that entity or that device or whatever. I've done a complete video on templating. It's quite complicated, but it is quite powerful. If you want to get something from one thing and make it into something else or do something to it before turning it into something else. Um, so yeah, have a look at that video if you want to learn more about templating. And this is where you can test out your templates and see if they work. And last of all, we have events. Now events is where you can either call an event or listen for a certain event that might have happened, whether that's a call service in a specific call service or a change of state. There are some things that you can only discover by using events, such as widgets on your phone. If you press a widget, then there's no entity associated to that widget. So the only way that you know that that widget has been set or pressed is because an event has occurred. So you need to listen to that event in order to trigger an automation, for example. If we move on to the supervisor tab, this is everything to do with home assistant supervisor, surprisingly enough. So on the info, it's got all the information about the home assistant supervisor, including the supervisor logs, sometimes very useful. Next, we have snapshots. This is what home assistant calls backups. This is where you can create snapshots or recall snapshots or download snapshots. They're all here. Uh, and then we have the add-on store. Now add-ons give extra functionality to Home Assistant, which might not necessarily be built in. This could be something like a file editor, or a DNS server, or Node-RED. I talk about Node-RED a lot, and that's because I love it. It's basically a different way of creating automations in Home Assistant. It uses a more visual flow-based approach, rather than kind of a linear structure which Home Assistant uses. There are loads of really useful add-ons in Home Assistant, but I'll come onto them or onto the key ones that I think you should get in my next video. And lastly, we have Dashboard. This is where you can see and configure all the add-ons you have installed. In here, it will also pop up with any Home Assistant updates or any Home Assistant OS updates. Now, if we jump to the bottom, we can see our name. If we click on that, that's kind of our user settings. This is where we could change our themes or our notification settings or our keyboard shortcuts turning them on or off. And you can also enable advanced mode. If you have advanced mode disabled, then some customization or some control over various things will not appear in your interface. So if I were you and this and you're the admin for it, then I'd make sure advanced mode is turned on. So you can have ultimate control over your home assistant setup. Obviously, notifications is where the notifications pop up. And then we have the main chunk of this video, the configuration. This is all of the settings to do with Home Assistant, all the key settings, I suppose. Let's start at the bottom. We have customization. This is where you can take an entity and customize various different attributes of it, such as its logo or its icon or other information, its name, its friendly name, that kind of thing. It can all be done in this editor. Next up, we have info. This is like the info tab we saw before, but more for Home Assistant core than supervised. It'll tell you which integrations you have enabled, some firmware versions, some information about the host machine you're running on. Now we have logs. Again, this is the core logs, not the supervisor logs. But this is where any of your kind of integration issues will pop up. A great place to start when you're troubleshooting something that hasn't worked. Next up, we have server controls. Now this is going to be a page you visit quite a lot. 
This is where you need to go if you want to restart Home Assistant. If you make any configuration changes in your configuration file or any other YAML file, then you need to reload that part of Home Assistant. Or if you can't just reload that part of Home Assistant, you need to restart the whole of Home Assistant. At the top of this page is a very useful button called Check Configuration. This will just run a basic check over your configuration files to make sure you haven't made any mistakes in your coding. So make sure you run that first and get, make sure your configuration is valid before you restart Home Assistant. Otherwise, you might run into a few problems. In general, we can change the home location, the elevation, and the default units for the home instance. And we can also set the internal and external URLs. Now, I won't go into much detail about this because I'm doing another video on it. But basically, the internal URL is where you need to go to access your Home Assistant when you're inside your home network. And the external URL is where you need to go to access your Home Assistant outside the home network. You won't have an external URL set up yet, but make sure you keep an eye out for my future video where I'll go into setting up DuckDNS to do that. Next up, we have users. In here, you can add more users. These are kind of logins for Home Assistant. Then we have zones. Now, zones is where you can manage anything that you want to appear on a map. If a device tracker is in a zone, then its location will be marked as that zone. So it's quite useful to know if, for example, you're at home or you're at work. I'd recommend adding zones for frequently frequented locations, such as work or the gym or a coffee shop or whatever. The people section allows you to add people into your home assistant. So these will be the, the people in your house. And once you've got people in your house, you can give them logins or not necessarily, or you can attach device trackers to them. So it will know that if that device tracker is at home, then it means that person is at home. The dashboard section is where you can manage your Lovelace dashboards. If you have multiple dashboards, you can see them all listed here. You can tell them to show in the sidebar or not, tell them to only be available for admins or not, for example. And next to that, we have resources. This is where you can add in extra custom cards for your Lovelace. A card is something that appears on your Lovelace dashboard, basically. And you can create custom cards or use custom cards, which might or might not be available in the hack store. Again, we'll come on to the hack store later in another video. And lastly, we have tags. Tags is where you can manage any NFC tags that you might want to use in your Home Assistant setup. The next section is all about automation. The last tab in automation is helpers. These are things that might help you creating automations. Things like input booleans or toggle switches or input selects where you can select from a drop down list or input numbers where you can enter a number or input times where you can enter a specific time. This could be used to trigger an automation or you could have an automation trigger setting that to a certain value, for example. After that, we have scripts. Now, scripts are kind of like automations, but they don't have a trigger. So you manually trigger a script. It's basically a sequence of things that you want to happen in that sequence. So if you trigger a script, you might have a light coming on, then you might wait 10 seconds, then you might have some music playing, then you might wait 15 seconds, and then you might have something else in that order. And a script is a good way to kind of capture that. And that's different from a scene, because a scene is just the state of all the devices at one go. So you record your scene, and then you trigger that scene, and all the devices will instantly go to that state. There's no fade, there's no delays, there's no this, then this, then this. It's just a scene. And obviously the first tab is automations. Now, I don't personally use this method of creating automations because I use Node-RED. But in here, you can create an automation uh, with a trigger and various things that would happen afterwards. This section is the areas. Now, as I mentioned earlier, areas are like rooms in your house. So you can create and manage your areas here. If you click on it, you can see which devices are in an area or which automations or scripts or scenes are tagged to that area as well. A nice useful way of keeping track of your devices. And lastly, we have the devices themselves. Now this is kind of split up from entities to devices to integrations. 
An integration is kind of one big brand, for example. So you might have a Sonos integration or a Philips Hue integration. Inside your integration, you will have potentially multiple devices. So inside Sonos, I've got four Sonos speakers. They're devices. And each device may have multiple entities. For example, with Pi-hole, I've got one device, which is my Pi-hole setup, but in that, I've got over 10 different entities. This could be the different sensors or even the toggle. So anything that's kind of a different type will show up as a different entity. For example, a security camera with motion detection will have a camera feed, but it will also have an input boolean to turn on the night vision, for example, and it might have a binary sensor saying whether there's motion being detected. It might have another sensor which says what type of motion is being detected. There are loads of different kind of things that would go within that one camera or that one device. Now that's the Home Assistant interface. Hopefully now you'll be able to work your way around the interface a bit easy, more easily and you'll be able to kind of go into the right direction to get the information that you're looking for. Keep an eye out for my next video where I'll look into the add-ons of Home Assistant. I'll recommend some basic add-ons that I think you should get and I'll go through the configuration process of them. So, there we go. We now know where everything is in Home Assistant. Make sure you hit subscribe below and click that bell icon to find out more about my smart tech and how you can build yourself the ultimate smart home.